Warning, Kind of Murdery contains adult themes, explicit language, and descriptions of violence. It is not suitable for anyone, and we recommend you stop listening now. Hello everyone, and welcome to Kind of Murdery, a true crime podcast that's mostly about murder, and always about the strange and compelling stories that arise when the path less traveled twists to darkness, and those who walk its shadows surrender to violence and moral corruption. I'm your host, Zevin Odelberg, and we have a perilous journey ahead, so thank you for lending me your courage and good company. Happy to be here with you today on Kinda Murdery. I wanted to say right here at the top that Derek Hayes and his wife Sarah from Monsters Among Us are good friends of the show, and they're running a promo for us at the moment. Thank you so much, Derek and Sarah. So if you happen to be here because you're a Monsters Among Us fan, welcome. Very happy to have you. And if you're listening and you're not familiar with Monsters Among Us, it is a fantastic podcast. I sincerely suggest you check it out. They've won the People's Choice Award for a couple years running now. It's really a great show with gripping stories built around listeners' real-life paranormal encounters. Two things inspired me to set up the Kind of Murdery hotline, 888-MURDERY. One, the great stories that some of you have shared with me via email. I wanted to make that sharing easier. And two, Monsters Among Us. Derek is the true master of using listener stories to create a compelling podcast. I had Derek on the show last March for a story called The Decapitation of Eddie King that features ghosts and witches. I know we've got a real-life leprechaun story in the episode bank, at least one Bigfoot story, and we had Jerry Polly from Hillbilly Horror Stories, another great show, on, and he talked about growing up in a haunted house with a mother who triggered poltergeists. Just a couple episodes ago, I told a story that touches on werewolves, and today's episode is a murder story that features a famous ghost. So if you're more of a paranormal fan than a true crime fan, Hopefully, Kinda Murdery can still tickle your fancy. And hey, if you're here for murder, thanks for being here, and you're going to get that too. Now, the Kinda Murdery hotline, 888-MURDERY, that's 888-687-3379, is brand new. So I haven't had a chance to share recorded listener stories yet, but that's coming soon too. And if you have a Kinda Murdery story to tell, please do call and share it with me. Now, as I said, today's story is a murder story featuring a famous ghost. And when it comes to ghosts and whether or not people believe in them, it seems to me that there are really four categories. There are two kinds of believers, there are agnostics, and then there are non-believers. So the believers break down like this. There are witnesses. These are people that not only believe in ghosts, but have had first-hand experience with them. They have witnessed ghostly phenomenon. Then there's what I call the faithful, those who haven't seen or experienced a ghost themselves, but... They know they must be real. After all, in the words of the immortal bard, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy, and the supernatural falls into that category. Then we have agnostics, people who don't necessarily believe, but don't necessarily not believe, and are open to the possibility. And finally, there are non-believers, which really needs no explanation. I happen to be in the first category myself, that of the witnesses which is probably why I'm a fan of Monsters Among Us. But when I say witnesses, I'm referring to living people who witness ghosts. But what if there was another kind of ghost witness? That's right. What if the ghost itself was a witness in court? Sound crazy? Maybe not so much, because whether or not you believe in ghosts, it is a documented fact that a ghost enters the law books and the legal records in the state of West Virginia. In 1897... The testimony of a ghost led directly to the conviction of a serial wife killer named Erasmus Shue. Now, pirates famously say, get ready for my pirate accent here, dead men tell no tales. But perhaps the same is not true of dead women. Feels awkward having a punchline there about a dead woman, but I couldn't resist the whole dead men, dead women thing, since this is, after all, a story about a ghost who testifies against her own killer. And so, with that, caveats included, if you're ready, I suggest that you put your personal items underneath the seat in front of you, stow your carry-on in the overhead compartment, let go of the worries of the day, but be sure your seatbelt is fastened. There's turbulence, expected, ahead, kind of murderies, permission to treat the witness as spectral. The true testimony of the Greenbrier ghost starts now.
In the final years of the 19th century, in the small and dull village of Livesay's Mill in Greenbrier County, West Virginia, nothing ever happened. Surrounded by the lush green scenery of West Virginian landscape, the lives of the people living there moved slowly along. Then, a stranger arrived, Erasmus Shue, a former resident of Pocahontas County. He came to Greenbrier to work for James Crookshanks at the blacksmith shop. Erasmus was a towering man of unknown strength, and he presented a striking figure as he forged horseshoes before the flaming fire. He was a young man, strong and muscular. The new handsome worker at the blacksmith's shop usually introduced himself as Erasmus, but he was called Trout by the rest. He was a mysterious figure, and alluring, as both mystery and good looks can be. But a pretty face can hide dark secrets very well. Despite the fact that Erasmus had been married twice before, and that both of his wives had died suddenly, young Miss Zona Heaster fell madly in love with Shu, and after a brief courtship they were married. Their little home seemed complete with happiness. No one would ever suspect that their love story would end in tragedy. As a boy, Anderson Jones would become a key figure in this story. Anderson was about 11 years old in November of 1896 when Shue married Miss Zona Heaster of the Meadow Bluff District at the Old Methodist Church in Livesay's Mill. After the wedding, Erasmus and his bride took up residence in a small two-story frame building that had been the residence of the late William G. Livesay, the man who gave the settlement of Livesay's Mill its name. Barely two months after her wedding, in the early days of January 1897, Mrs. Shue fell ill. For several weeks, she was under the care of Dr. J. M. Knapp. Mr. Shu appeared very attentive to his bride's needs, giving no cause for suspicion of what was in his mind. Early, on the morning of January 22nd, Shu appeared at the cabin of Aunt Martha Jones, the mother of Anderson Jones, who I mentioned a moment ago, the 11-year-old boy, and Shu requested that Anderson go to his house and attend to some chores for Mrs. Shu, who wasn't feeling well. Years later, as an adult, Anderson Jones, an African-American man, would shake his graying head and say, I can remember it well. It was a Saturday. Mammy told Mr. Shu I had to go to Dr. Knapp's first and finish some work there. Mr. Shu seemed to resent this, but he asked if I would go by his house later in the day. Four times he came back to the house for me, and each time I was busy. About 1 p.m. he came again, and I agreed to run his errand. Going to the shoe house, I felt like something was wrong. All the doors were closed, and there was an air about the place I did not like. Reaching the steps, I saw a trail of blood. That scared me, but I went to the door and knocked. No one answered. I tried it and finding the door unlocked, I walked into the kitchen. The trail of blood continued across the floor into the dining room. This door, too, was closed. Once more, I knocked, and getting no answer, I walked in. I stumbled over Mrs. Shue's body. There she was, stretched out on the floor, looking right up at me through wide-open eyes. She seemed to be laughing. I was frightened, but still able to reach down and shake her. She was stiff and cold. Running from the house, I called across the field to my mother. Mrs. Shue is dead. As she ran to the house, I went down the road for Mr. Shue, finding him at the blacksmith's shop with Charles Tapscott. When I told him what I found, he yelled and, with Mr. Tapscott, started for the house. I continued on to get Dr. Knapp. When we reached the house, Shu had taken his wife from the floor, placed her on the bed, and held her in his arms, crying for her to come back. But the strangest thing was, although no one thought of it at the time, he had dressed Mrs. Shu, placing one of those old-fashioned high, stiff collars around her neck and holding it in place with some kind of scarf. Dr. Knapp immediately started an investigation to determine if Mrs. Shu was still alive. Throughout his efforts to revive the woman, Shu continued to hold her head, refusing to let him examine it. Finally, the doctor turned and said, It's an everlasting faint. Her heart has failed. The next morning, Mrs. Shu's body, accompanied by her husband and several neighbors, was taken over the mountain to Mrs. Heaster's home. On Monday, she buried Zona in the little family graveyard high up on the side of the mountain. Before the funeral, Mr. Shu never once left his dead wife's side in the presence of others. When not at the coffin, he permitted no one else to go near it, not even her mother. Taking his place at the head of the corpse, he guarded it closely. In addition, he placed a folded sheet on one side of his wife's head and some nondescript garment on the other. They served to keep the head in an upright position. Several days after the funeral, Mrs. Heaster was awakened from her slumber by a noise in the little cabin room. Startled, she recalled constant prayers since her daughter's death, prayers that the real solution of Zona's passing would be revealed. Perhaps those prayers were about to be answered. Peering through the darkened room, Mrs. Heaster made out a ghostly figure. It was her daughter, dressed in the very dress she had died in. The young girl seemed about to speak, but when her mother reached out her hand, Zona disappeared. 
The next night, Mrs. Heaster resumed her prayers, praying long and earnestly that her daughter would return to explain her death. Once more, those prayers were answered. Zona talked more freely, promising her mother that she would tell her the entire story of the mysterious affair. A third visit was followed by a fourth, and finally, Zona revealed that she had been murdered by her husband, Erasmus Shue. Secure in the knowledge that her son-in-law had murdered her beloved daughter, Mrs. Heaster set out to trap him. At first, it was not easy. Neighbors listened a little sadly to the unusual story, but merely shook their heads. Authorities also offered little additional comfort. Several days passed, and then Johnson Heaster, a brother-in-law, satisfied that the story had some foundation to it, went over the mountain to Livesay's Mill to talk with Shu. Their conversation further aroused Johnson's suspicions. Then, after talking with Anderson Jones and others who had been present at the house when his niece's body was found, Johnson Heaster, the uncle, was convinced that his niece was the victim of foul play. Together, Johnson and the murdered girl's mother went to Lewisburg for a conference with prosecuting attorney John A. Preston, one of the most brilliant lawyers of his day. Preston had already heard of the weird story which had spread around the country like wildfire. He gave little credence to it, but now the girl's mother was before him, sincere in her efforts to trap a murderer, and firm in the belief that what she had to say was true, and her brother-in-law was there also to add his suspicions, gathered from neighbors. For several hours the three conversed. When the meeting concluded, Attorney Preston started the wheels of justice moving toward one of the strangest and most fantastic murder trials ever held in the history of not only West Virginia, but the United States. First, Preston questioned Dr. Knapp. The kindly old physician admitted his verdict of heart failure as the cause of Mrs. Shue's death could be wrong. While it was true that Mrs. Shue had been ailing, circumstances surrounding her death had given even Dr. Knapp some cause for suspicion, and both men agreed an autopsy would prove whether or not Mrs. Heaster's strange theory was true. If it was not, the examination would at least serve to relieve the aching heart of a saddened mother, and have the added benefit of removing undue suspicion from a bereft husband, Mr. Shue. The next day, Attorney Preston and Dr. Knapp went to Livesay's mill, informed Shue of their plans, and ordered him to accompany them over the mountain to his wife's grave. In addition, they took little Anderson Jones and his mother along. Shu vigorously protested against such action, but he dared not to refuse the company of the investigating party. Throughout the long journey, Erasmus Shu kept muttering, I don't know what in the name of God they're taking her up for, they're not going to find anything, but he was wrong. Reaching the mountain grave, Preston ordered several neighbors to exhume the body of Mrs. Shu. Such action, although commonplace today, had never been heard of in Greenbrier County, so it was only after considerable argument and threats of arrest that Preston succeeded in having the coffin raised from the grave and carried up the road to the schoolhouse. Shu was taken along to the little building, then required to remain in the room while Dr. Knapp performed his autopsy. First, the physician searched for poison but found no trace of it. He worked over the body for three days and nights seeking a cause of death. During that time, Shu, visibly nervous but maintaining his innocence, sat on a large packing box whittling with his knife. Anderson Jones, the young lad who had ran the errand and found the body of Mrs. Shu, was there during the entire examination. On the third day, Dr. Knapp was about to give up when he made a startling discovery, and you'll find out what it was right after the break. Welcome back, everybody. Before we jump back into the story, I wanted to take a quick moment to remind you, as I often do, about the free three-digit number, Lifeline number 988, that you can call to receive immediate counseling for substance use, mental health, or suicidal thoughts. So please, if you're in acute crisis, dial 988. Program it into your phone now. And always, always remember that the world is a better place with you in it. And if you're not in acute crisis, but you'd just like to connect with someone, please don't hesitate to reach out to me, kindamurdery at gmail.com or at kindamurdery on all social media. And you can also call the Kinda Murdery hotline, 888-MURDERY. Of course, I'm hoping you all will call and tell me amazing Kinda Murdery stories that I can share on the show. But if you'd like to call just to talk to me about how you're feeling, what you're going through, that's okay too. I'm here. I care, and I would love to connect with you. So again, kindamurdery at gmail.com, at kindamurdery on all social media, 
or 888 murdery But also, again, please do remember that I am not qualified to help you if you are in immediate crisis. In that case, please do call 988. Otherwise, go ahead and reach out to me. And additionally, if you're someone with a disability, physical or otherwise, who is struggling and you would like to connect with someone in that way, please do. 888-MURDERY, kindermurdery at gmail.com or at kindermurdery on all social media. I myself have cerebral palsy and it is my hope that the Kind of Murdery community can become a place where we all support each other and really not just people with disabilities, but anyone who's going through something challenging and anyone who feels like their life experience is a little bit different than what most people might be accustomed to. I've said this before, but I believe that by sharing our stories, we can all become a little more human to each other. And that we can build empathy that way, which is absolutely something that this world needs. And finally, we're just about to get back to the story, but please, please do call 888-MURDERY and tell me your very own kind of murdery stories. And remember, they don't have to have anything to do with murder. They can just be a crazy story about something that happened to you. I'm sure your lives are compelling and I want to learn about them and share them with the community. And with that... Let's get back to the story and find out just exactly what Dr. Knapp discovered. On the third day of the autopsy, Dr. Knapp was about to give up when he made a startling discovery, the very discovery that Mrs. Heaster had predicted. Anderson Jones recounted, Dr. Knapp was working around Mrs. Shue's head. I could see Shue was getting more nervous. His whittling was jerky. It was not so good. Suddenly, the doctor turned to Mr. Preston. They whispered together for a few minutes. Then Mr. Preston turned to Shue and said, well, Shu, we found your wife's neck to be broken. Shu's head dropped. A change came over him. Anderson Jones went on to say that he couldn't explain what the change was, but that it certainly proved Shu's guilt to him. After the autopsy, Zona Shu's body was placed once more in its little grave, and the wheels of the ghost's vengeance began to turn. Erasmus Shu was placed under arrest by Sheriff Hill Nickel, and the authorities started back with him to his home at Livesay's Mill. Arriving at the house the next day, Shu seemed in brighter spirits and offered the party breakfast. When they accepted, he cooked the meal himself, and then announced that he was ready to go to jail. At Lewisburg, he was charged with the murder of Mrs. Shu and placed in the county jail without bond to await the June term of the Greenbrier County Circuit Court for trial before Judge J. M. McWhorter. Shu accepted no responsibility for his wife's murder and pleaded not guilty. He was nonetheless charged with the circumstantial evidence. Prison didn't sit well with Erasmus Trout Shu. And the Pocahontas Times reported that Trout Shu, aka Erasmus Shu, is now in jail awaiting trial for the murder of his wife and has threatened to kill himself. Prosecuting attorney Preston and his assistant Henry Gilmer spent several months seeking additional evidence against Shu. Both feared that the testimony of Mrs. Heaster revealing the eyewitness account of her daughter's ghost would not convict their prisoner. In the meantime, Shu obtained Dr. William Rucker and James P.D. Gardner to defend him. The case finally came before the court on June 30th. The little courtroom was taxed to capacity by neighbors from both sides of Sewell Mountain. Some came to testify, others to hear Mrs. Heaster's recital of her encounter with her daughter's ghost. There was little difficulty in securing a jury. Within an hour, the trial was on. In his opening argument, attorney Preston told the jury that the state's case against Shu was entirely circumstantial, but that the evidence was such as had never been presented in any court before. He stressed that the dream testimony to be presented would prove beyond a doubt to be authentic, and informed the jurors that he himself could prove it. Dr. Knapp was the first witness called. He told of conducting the post-mortem examination and finding Mrs. Shu's death had resulted from a broken neck, dislocated so perfectly that it escaped his observation for three days. At the same time, the physician pointed out that the break was of such a nature that Mrs. Shu could not have done it herself in a suicide attempt. The physician declared that he made the usual examination of Mrs. Shu when she was found dead and had pronounced her demise due to heart failure or an everlasting faint only after Shu himself had refused to relinquish his wife's head and had requested the doctor not to examine it. Boy, that was one trusting country doctor, eh? Anderson Jones testified to the defendant's repeated efforts to get him to go to the house and see if his wife wanted anything that led to Jones finding the body. That, of course, seems like a pretty transparent attempt to make himself look innocent and have the murder discovered by surprise. Other witnesses stated that Shu was the only person seen about or known to have been in the house that morning before his wife was found dead. 
They told how he assisted in dressing Mrs. Shu and, in doing so, dressing Mrs. Shu's dead body, that is, and in doing so, placed a high, stiff collar around her neck. Then he'd added a large veil, several times folded, and tied in a large bow under the chin around the collar, like someone who was trying to prop up a broken neck. Still, other witnesses related how the victim's head appeared to be very loose at the neck and, when not supported, dropped from side to side. Others testified that in his conversation and conduct after Mrs. Shu's death, the defendant failed to show a proper appreciation of the loss he'd sustained. One testified that when Shu had been summoned to the post-mortem inquest over at Sewell, Shu declared that he would come back under arrest, but that he knew they could not prove him guilty of murder. All of this testimony was leading up to the expected dramatic appearance of the victim's mother, Mrs. Heaster. As for Erasmus Trout Shu, the blacksmith and accused murderer himself, he said that the charges were nonsense, nothing more than the tales of a spiteful mother-in-law. During the trial, though, it was revealed that Zona was not his first wife. She was his third, and the first one left him because of his beatings. Her name was Ali Estelin Cutlip, and Trout beat his wife so bad that a group of men dragged him out of bed one winter night and threw him in the icy water of the Greenbrier River as revenge. Allie would give birth to a child named Gerda Lucretia in 1887, and she got out of the marriage on grounds of divorce four years later. Trout's second wife was not as lucky. In 1894, he married once again, and Lucy Ann Tritt died eight months later. But at this death, there was no investigation, and the Pocahontas Times only stated that she died suddenly. Still, obviously, after the death of Zona, the rumors about what really happened to Lucy Ann started circulating again. All the evidence presented so far was purely circumstantial, and as Shu denied it, there was, it seemed, at best a 50-50 chance of him being convicted of the crime, perhaps worse. And yet, the entire courtroom waited with bated breath for the testimony of Zona's mother. Finally, the aged mother was called to the stand. With an air of determination, she told how she'd been unsatisfied about the cause of her daughter's death, and how she had prayed that her daughter might return from her grave and solve the mystery. She told how she'd been visited in her little bedroom by her daughter's ghost four separate times, and how the girl's specter described her own death at the hands of a scheming and brutal husband. Attorney Preston knew that undue elaboration on Mrs. Heaster's dreams would make them too fantastic for any jury to believe, so he merely traced them lightly with his star witness. He further realized defense attorneys would try to break down this startling testimony. Perhaps counterintuitively, this is how Preston thought that his case would be won because Mrs. Heaster had won him over during his own efforts to break down her story as one purely of vivid imagination, and he believed that the murdered girl's mother would have the same effect on the jury under cross-examination. Dr. Rucker, defense counsel, lost no time in getting at the dreams. Dreams is how he described Mrs. Heaster's encounters with her daughter's ghost. Unaware of the encounter's full significance, he endeavored to blast it out of the courtroom as a start for his defense. I'm now going to share... The actual testimony of Mrs. Heaster, the murdered Zona Shoe's mother. Rather than stating the name of the speaker before each statement, the speakers being Dr. Rucker, the defense counsel, and Mrs. Heaster herself, I'll instead use a different voice for each speaker, and hopefully, whose speaking will be obvious. Apologies if my acting abilities here are subpar. Again, the speakers are Dr. Rucker, Erasmus Shoe's defense attorney, and Mrs. Heaster, the mother of the murdered woman. Here we go. Mrs. Heaster, did you not have a dream that aroused your suspicions to lead you to have the body exhumed? I had no dream, for I was as fully awake as I am this moment. And did you or did you not have a dream or a vision that led you to have the body disinterred? Well, I was not satisfied that my daughter came to her death of natural causes, so I prayed that it might be revealed to me how she died. After about an hour spent in prayer, I turned over and over, and there stood my daughter. She seemed to hesitate to speak to me, and then departed. The next night, after I prayed again that the manner of her death might be shown, she appeared and talked more freely, giving me to understand that I should be acquainted with the whole matter. The third night she appeared again and disclosed more to me, and on the fourth night she returned and told me all about the difficulty, how it occurred, and how it was brought about. She said, he came that night from the shop and seemed angry. I told him supper was ready and he began to chide me because I'd prepared no meat. I replied that there was plenty, bread and butter and applesauce and preserves and other things that made a good supper. He flew into a rage, got up and came toward me, 
When I raised up, he seized each side of my head with his hands, and by a sudden wrench, dislocated my neck. Mrs. Heaster continued the remainder of her answer. Then my daughter went on to describe the home where she lived and the surroundings in the neighborhood so that it was fixed in my mind as a reality. When I later described it for people living near there, they told me that they could not have been more accurate in describing it themselves. Then she told me I could look back at the Aunt Martha Jones's place in the meadow in a rocky place and that I could look in the cellar behind a loose plank and see. Her house was a big square log house, hewed right up to the square, and she said for me to look at the right-hand side of the door as you go in, and in the right-hand corner, I saw the place exactly as she told me, and I saw the blood there as she told me. Now, Mrs. Heaster, said Rucker, the defense attorney, this sad affair was particularly impressed upon your mind, and there was not a moment during your waking hours that you did not dwell upon it, isn't that right? No, sir. There was not a moment, and there is not yet either. And this was not a dream founded upon your distressed condition of mind? No, sir, it was not a dream. I was as wide awake as ever I was. Then, if not a dream or dreams, what do you call it? I prayed to the Lord that she might come back and tell me what happened, and I prayed that she might come herself and tell on him. Do you think you actually saw your daughter in the flesh and blood? Yes, sir, I do. I told them the very dress she was wearing when she was murdered. When she was about to leave the room, she turned her head completely around and looked at me like she wanted me to know all about it. And the next time she returned, she told me all about it. The first time she came, she seemed as if she did not want to tell me as much as afterwards. The last night she came, she told me she had done everything she could, and I am satisfied that she did all that too. Now, Mrs. Heaster, don't you know these visions, as you term or describe them, were nothing more or less than four dreams founded upon your distress? No, I don't know it. The Lord sent her to me to tell it. I was the only friend she knew she could tell and put any confidence in. I was the nearest one to her. Shu gave me a ring he pretended she wanted me to have, but I don't know what dead woman he might have taken it off of. I wanted my daughter's own ring, but he would not let me have it. Mrs. Heaster, are you positively sure there were not four dreams? Yes, sir, they were not dreams. I do not dream when I am wide awake, to be sure, and I know I saw her right there before me. Are you considerably superstitious? No, sir, I am not. I was never that way before, and I am not now. Do you believe in the scripture? Well, yes, sir, I have no reason not to believe in them. And do you believe the scripture contains the words of God and his son? Well, yes, sir, I do. Don't you believe it? Now, I would like, if I could, to get you to say these were four dreams and not visions or appearances of your daughter in flesh and blood. If I'm going to say that, I'm going to lie. Then you insist that your daughter actually appeared in flesh and blood before you on four different occasions. Yes, sir. Did she not have any other conversations with you other than the matter of her death? Well, yes, sir. Some, some little things. Some things I've forgotten. Just, just a few words. I just wanted the particulars about her death, you see, and, and I got them. When she came, did you touch her? Yes, sir. I got up on my elbows and reached out a little further as I wanted to see if people came in their coffins. I leaned up and I made a light. I wanted to see if there was a coffin, but there was not. She was just like she was when she left this world. It was just after I'd gone to bed. I wanted her to come and talk to me, and she did. This was before the inquest, and I told my neighbors. They said she was exactly as I told them she was. Had you ever seen the premises where your daughter lived before these visits? No, sir, I had not, but I found them exactly as she told me they were. She told me all of this before I knew anything about the building at all. How long was it after you had those interviews with your daughter until you saw the buildings? It must have been a month or more after the examination. You said your daughter told you that down by the fence in a rocky place you would find something. She said for me to look there, but she didn't say I would find anything, just, just for me to look there. Did she tell you what to look for? Well, no, sir, she did not. I was so glad to see her, I forgot to ask. Have you examined the place since? Yes, sir. We looked at the fence a little, but we didn't find anything. And that was Mrs. Heaster's testimony. Now, Shu himself, the accused murderer, Erasmus Shu, spent nearly an entire day on the witness stand seeking to build a defense for himself. He talked at very great length and was very minute and particular in describing unimportant events, but denied practically everything testified to by any of the other witnesses. He entered a positive denial of the charge against him, terming the prosecution spite work. In closing, he vehemently protested his innocence, calling on God to witness. Though he admitted he had served a term in the penitentiary, he declared he loved his late wife dearly and appealed to members of the jury to look into his eyes and see if they said he was guilty. But his testimony and his desperate attempts failed to sway the jury and certainly made a most unfavorable impression. 
So great did the state's case appear against him that Mr. Dennis, editor of the Greenbrier Independent, wrote in his paper, Well, there's no middle ground for the jury to take. The verdict inevitably must be for murder in the first degree or for an acquittal. After lengthy arguments of the evidence by counsel for both state and the defendant, Shue's case was given to the jury. They solemnly filed from the room to perform their duty, and then returned an hour later with a verdict of murder in the first degree, recommending life imprisonment. After the verdict was announced, Mr. Dennis again wrote in his paper, Taking the verdict of this jury as ascertaining the truth, we must conclude that Shue deliberately broke his wife's neck, probably with his strong hands, and with no other motive than to be rid of her so he might get another one more to his liking. In fact, there were acquaintances of Shue's who claimed that he'd once boasted that he would have seven wives. It seems that the dark implications of that intent were now stymied after wife number three. The twelve-man jury who'd recommended life in prison and the many spectators in the courtroom did not see eye to eye in regards to a proper verdict and penalty. Many people not connected with the trial expressed the opinion that the death penalty should have been imposed. Rumors of mob violence grew. Sentiment crystallized. On the Sunday following Shue's conviction, a small mob gathered at Meadow Bluff campgrounds to take the prisoner from his cell in the county jail and hang him. Shue's fate, the mob decreed, should be the same he had judged and carried out for his innocent wife. Death by a broken neck. At 10 o'clock, they gathered at the rendezvous, eight miles from Lewisburg. One man, however, decided his neighbors were making a terrible mistake. He was George M. Hera. Hearing of the plan, Hera mounted his horse and hurried to the house of Sheriff Nickel at Meadow Bluff. Both men started for Lewisburg to protect the prisoner, but to reach there they had to pass the campgrounds. Somebody in the mob recognized the sheriff as he sped down the road past the grounds on his horse. Several would-be lynchers gave chase. They captured the two men at the point of pistols. Sheriff Nickel drew his gun and was about to fire despite overwhelming odds when he recognized his assailant. Mob leaders went with him to the nearby home of D.A. Dwyer. There, after considerable argument, Sheriff Nickel won his point. The mob disbanded, handing over to him the new stout rope with which they had planned to carry out the hanging of Erasmus Shoe. And in fact, some 76 years later, in April of 1973, the son of one of the jurors during Shoe's trial wrote to the Beckley Post Herald, saying that even if the sheriff had failed to defuse the mob's desire to lynch Shoe, they would not have been able to, because the sheriff fearing mob violence, had actually removed Shu from the jail and handcuffed him to one of the deputies who hid in a nearby cornfield, so if the mob had gone to the jail, they would not, in fact, have found Shu. But go they did not. Wow, uh, not exactly sure why I'm talking like Yoda all of a sudden, but the mob gave up on the lynching, and two days later, Shu was taken to Moundsville Penitentiary to spend the rest of his life behind bars, a life that ended only eight years later, when he died. While the story of his murdered wife, the story of the Greenbrier ghost, remains immortal. I'm Zevin Odelberg, and this has been Kinda Murdery. Remember, call 888-MURDERY, that's 888-687-3379, and tell me your Kinda Murdery story, and check out Monsters Among Us. I promise you, you're gonna love it. I hope you enjoyed Kinda Murderies, permission to treat the witness as spectral, the true testimony of the Greenbrier ghost. I'll see you Sunday, everybody. 